song service. Let's take our Bibles. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. And as you know, uh, we've been uh, studying the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Luke, chapter 24. Uh, today, we're going to continue that. Uh, we're talking about that day of our Lord's resurrection. We are on to the scene in regard to Peter and now also John. Uh, coming to the tomb of our Lord and finding it empty. So today we're going to uh, finish up what Luke has to say about this and then also go into John's gospel and just see the added additions that he brings into it and understand the various principles and precepts that we find uh, in both of those passages. But again, in uh, Luke chapter uh, 24, now in verse 12, we see John, excuse me, we see Peter running to the tomb in Luke's gospel. And then when John writes about it, again, he includes himself Without naming himself, as you know, John writes about himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. But we know that to be John the Apostle. So uh, that's what we're noting and understanding. So let's go back and uh, see in verse 20, uh, chapter 24, now in verse 12. It says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went to his home, marveling at that which had Happened. So again, we see him coming to the tomb, seeing the empty tomb. He sees the uh, burial cloths of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he returns, as it says, back to his home. But I'm going to share with you what the Greek actually says about that. But as I noted on Thursday night of this past week, this shows the beginning of the revival in Peter's spiritual life. Remember, the last time we saw Peter was when he was sitting around a campfire outside the house of Caiaphas at the trials, uh, the first two trials of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where he denied our Lord three times, as Jesus predicted. And then we see him leaving that scene, weeping bitterly for the regret and the remorse of denying his Lord and Savior. But then we don't see Peter again until now, the tomb scene, where we see him receiving the message from the women who had already come to the tomb, found it empty, interacted with the angels and Jesus himself, relayed that message to the apostles, and yet they were disbelieving in what the women had to say. So that uh, ultimately sparked something in the heart of Peter, and we also see John in this instance as well, as we uh, note John's gospel, but it sparked something within his soul to get him to pick himself up and now move forward. And as we noted on Thursday night, that, m that word that we have for he got up is anistomy, which is the Greek word that is also used throughout the New Testament for resurrection. Certainly the resurrection of our Lord, that word is used. Our resurrection, that word is used as well. So here we see what we could call a revival or the resurrection of Peter's spiritual life. And that principle that we took away from this also on Thursday night was that when we do have a spiritual revival within our life, it does lead to action. Again, we can't have a spiritual revival that does not lead to action. We find throughout Scripture that if we are going to be positive towards the Word of God, certainly believing in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our Savior, we don't just stop there and say, okay, I believed in Jesus and that's all I should be doing. No. Our spiritual revival at the moment of our salvation should lead us to action, and the main action there should be to learn the Word of God and then be able to apply it within our lives. Here we see a believer who was positive towards the Word of God entered into a fit of reversionism in the denial of Jesus Christ, and just as we can go into reversionism based on sin, human good, or evil that we might uh, get sidetracked by in our life, we too can have a spiritual revival where we say, you know what, those things were wrong that I was doing. I confess that sin to my father and I want to change my mode of operation. And then we pick ourselves up and now we move forward in the plan of God once again by taking in the word and applying it consistently as God is leading us. So if we are to have a spiritual revival within our life, it always leads to action where now we're going forward in the plan of God. As Peter received this message, he was revived in his spiritual realm. It led him to action to now go to the tomb and witness it for himself. Yet unfortunately, and again as uh, baby believers sometimes get themselves involved in, or immature believers as we could call that, 
unfortunately, sometimes they get into the mode of operation of human good works, where they think that they have to just do something in order to be serving God, and yet what they're doing is in the wrong way, in the wrong motivation. You see, the first thing we need to do is get into the Word of God and then apply that Word, and when we apply it, that is what is leading us to action. But again, we should not be getting ourselves involved in actions just for action's sake. In other words, what we saw in these two individuals is that they were unbelieving in the message of Jesus Christ resurrected, and unless they saw it for themselves, they would not believe. And so they were under the mentality of seeing is believing, which isn't the best mentality for our spiritual walk. Yes, it can be applied. Yes, we can see things. And yes, God will work in your life if you're not doing it in the, uh, as I say, the easy way. If you're not doing things the easy way in the spiritual life of taking the initiative yourself to be positive towards the word and then applying it. God sometimes will lead you in that same direction in the negative way where he will do something, bring something into your life trying to wake you up so that you get back into his will and plan. And so sometimes we will see God working within our life that will lead us to believe and have that revival within our soul. But again, that's not the best way to do it as God has told us and as we also recognize uh, throughout the scriptures. And in fact, when we compare scripture with scripture, as we see these individuals, they're trying to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ themselves. And they're trying to do the work to prove it for themselves rather than just hearing the word and believing the word as we should. So what we see is that their human good works are wrought, uh, excuse me, their actions are wrought with human good works in this case. And it's really not all the way there yet in the spiritual life, but it's coming, okay? It's a revival. It's a beginning. And if they continue to go forward and continue to be positive, ultimately God will lead them in the right direction. As we noted in comparison to what our Lord tries to tell us in John chapter 11, verse 40, at the resurrection of Lazarus, that happened just the week prior to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say to Martha? He said, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You see, in God's plan, when we are operating in positive volition, we operate under the equation, believing is seen. In other words, when we take in the Word of God, believe upon the Word of God, have faith in God and His Word, then we're going to see the great actions of God working within our life, and that is the proper equation that we should be operating in. We shouldn't be the doubting Thomas of saying, no, I'm not going to believe unless I see. I'm not going to do this unless that happens. I'm not going to go forward in the plan of God unless God does this for me first. Okay? That's not the right mode of operation. The right mode of operation in the spiritual life is to believe the Word of God, applying that Word on a consistent basis, and then He's going to reveal His glory to you. And He's going to show you His great miracle signs and wonders within your life. So the right equation is believing is seeing. And as we also note in the uh, a book of James, chapter 1. Actually, let's turn to James because I want to show you chapter 2 as well. And it's a little too big to put on the slides. But let's go to James. Again, towards the... Uh, back half of the New Testament after the book of Hebrews. <coughs> but in James chapter 1, up on the board, it says, But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, again, not that we're under the Mosaic law, but now the law of liberty of God's grace, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but at what? An effectual doer. You see, the spiritual revival is that we are effectual doers. It says this man will be blessed in what he does. In other words, believing you will see. And remember what it says in James chapter 2 in verses 14 through 26. And I know there's this, uh, you know, back and forth controversy between Peter and, and oh, excuse me, James here, who was the half brother of Jesus Christ, and then also Paul in his writing. And remember, when Paul was writing by, about faith alone and Christ alone, what was he fighting against? He was fighting against the Pharisees and the, uh, the, uh, the Jews that were saying you can only be saved through the works of the law, by keeping the law, applying the law. But Jesus Christ had fulfilled the law, so no longer are we under the law. And Paul was trying to bring that to the Jewish people. We're no longer under the law. 
And every time you see him talking about faith in Christ, not by works, lest any man should boast, you understand that the works that are involved there are those that believe that through their works it will bring them salvation. But James also had to write and struggle with the people that were on the opposite effect, that thought that, oh, I just believe in Jesus Christ, that's all I have to do. And James is making the point that, yeah, you can be saved in that situation, but that's not the spiritual life. The spiritual life isn't just say, I believe, and that's all I have to do. No, the spiritual life is that I believe, and then I do what? I follow Jesus Christ. And how do you follow Jesus Christ? By taking in his word, applying his word, and then applying your spiritual gift and the time, the talent, the treasure that God has given to you. How do you apply that within your life? You see, there are works that we are to be doing as believers, but our works don't come first and then faith, okay? But what happens is we have faith in God that leads us in that spiritual revival to take action, which would be the works that we perform. But again, those works by themselves do not save us. And as James tries to point out, uh, faith by itself may not save you either. Because there's a lot of people out there, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. But yet our Lord says in, in, the, in, in the end times that when people stand before him, they're going to say to him, Lord, Lord. And Jesus is going to respond, I never knew you. I never knew you. Why? Because they didn't go forward in the plan of God. You see, they, the, the faith that they might think they have ultimately wasn't faith to save them because it was not represented through anything that they did after their spiritual life. And ultimately, there are no works to show after they had believed. So again, it's a very interesting aspect where, again, uh, Peter, excuse me, Paul and now James are also fighting against the works of the law, that that is not how you are saved. But if you are to be a faithful individual, there must be works within your life. All right, so let's go there again, uh, uh, James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 26. Now in verse 14 it says, What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Again, there's a lot of people, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, but yet they never do anything. They never go anywhere. And they never take in his word. They never learn his word, apply his word, or do anything for God. Now in verse 15, But if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Okay? Again, faith without works is dead if it's all by itself. And again, you can't just say, I, I believe, I believe, I believe, and then you never do anything in the spiritual life. You can't do it. Okay? If you believe, you're going to follow Jesus. And as we said at the tomb, what did Jesus say to, to, the, uh, to the women? get out of this tomb, go back to the brethren, and then tell them to meet me up in Galilee. In other words, follow me. We're not staying at the tomb. We're not staying in this dead place. We're going forward, and we're going back to where we had our works. And remember, most of Jesus' ministry and the disciples was up there in Galilee for the prior three years. So that's where they were returning, back to the place of performing their works. Now in verse 18, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. You ever think about that? You ever think about that? The demons know who Jesus Christ is. And as we studied the book of uh, uh, Luke, remember how we exercised demons? And they would come up and sometimes they would say, Jesus, Jesus, it's not yet our time. What do you have to do with us? At this time, it's not our time. You see, even the demons know that one day they're going to be cast into the eternal lake of fire and that Jesus Christ is going to be the one that does that. They know who he is. Yet they don't believe in him as their savior. Very interesting. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? 
you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And that's what it's all about, perfecting the faith, making sure that your faith is a real faith and not just a lip service faith that you believe because you think you've rubbed the, the, uh, the magic genie lamp for your salvation. Okay? It doesn't work that way. If you truly have faith, it is going to be demonstrated by your actions after you have believed in Jesus Christ. Now in verse 23, in the scriptures were fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. You see, he believed God, reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So again, seeing is believing is not the right equation. Believing is seeing is the right equation because when we believe, we will see the things of God working within our lives and the plan of God working around our lives as well. And so let's go back now to Luke uh, chapter 23, uh, 24 actually. Let's go back to Luke. <clears throat> and now it says, He saw the linen wrappings only. And in regard to these linen wrappings, it uh, utilizes uh, the Greek word, uh, which is anthanion, okay, anthanion. And this word does mean strips of small pieces of cloth. Now, back in chapter 23, when they were wrapping the body of Jesus Christ, and Joseph of Arimathea bought that linen to wrap the body of Jesus, it utilized the word there, sindon. But now, at the resurrection of our Lord, when Peter goes in and just sees the linen wrappings that wrap the body of our Lord, uh, excuse me, Luke is now using this word. Now they can somewhat be synonymous words, but ultimately Sindon was emphasizing the finer linen that Joseph of Arimathea had purchased compared to a normal burial of a commoner back in the ancient days. And as we know, Joseph of Arimathea wanted to glorify his Lord Jesus Christ by wrapping him in a finer linen. But interestingly enough, in both of these words, it's not talking about a big sheet. And again, in the notes, I gave you some more of the Greek and the detail of that. There's actually another Greek word that talks about a big sheet that could also be a sail on a ship, okay, or a sheet upon a bed. And that would be one piece. But here, these words are called strips of cloth. And that's how they used to wrap up the bodies in the ancient days, as we've noted and as we've understood. So again, I give you this so that we can recognize. And again, when we go back to John chapter 20, verse 7, which will be there in just a minute, there's actually another Greek word that is used for cloth in the burial of Jesus. And that is the word saudarion. And that ultimately means a piece of cloth that was to go over the face and around the head. And as you can see, it would be used for a handkerchief, a sweat cloth, or it, in this case, the face cloth for the burial. And I've seen a number of different uh, 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 definitions of this and application of this. And sometimes they thought they would take those strips of cloth and wrap it to keep the jaw closed as the jaw may come open as uh, uh, the body dies and the muscles are, are absolutely relaxed at that point. But in any case, we recognize that there was different cloth used in the wrapping of the face compared to the rest of the body. And I show you this picture because this is kind of a good imagery here. I'm going to come back. Uh, I won't show this picture later, but I want you to uh, reference this picture later because see how this is now mummified in this case? But there's no body inside there, okay? And you see the one that wrapped the body, and then you see the other that would wrap the head. And it's kind of interesting when they would put all those ointments onto the body, they would put them on the strips of cloth as well, and therefore, what would they would do maybe in three days? Maybe they would dry out. And when the body of Jesus Christ was resurrected, as I'm going to show you a picture later on that I'm not really keen about, but most pictures of the resurrection of Jesus show, you know, clothing, you know, strewn throughout the tomb, okay? And just all over the place, as if Jesus got up and unwrapped himself and just threw it aside, okay? But it probably ended up more like this, 
and it might have continued the body cavity of our Lord, even though the body was not in there, because, again, the stiffness of the wrapping with all the ointments and everything, if they had a chance to dry out within that short period of time. But at minimum, whether it was like, you know, uh, the body, uh, you know, encapsulated, like a cocoon almost, but it could have also just flattened out too, and it would have been like that. It wouldn't have been strewn all over the place. But the other aspect is that the headpiece was different from the body piece. And we're going to come back and uh, note that a little bit later. But I give you this because I talked about this back in chapter 23, verse 53, that whole shroud of Turin. I didn't show you a picture today in regard to that. That probably is a bunch of hogwash, okay? The shroud of Turin is probably hogwash because when we look at the Greek words, we're talking about strips of cloth where the shroud of Turin is one piece of cloth from head to toe. And ultimately, the face and the body and all the, you know, the markings that they talk about with the hands and the feet and the side, the crown of thorns on the face is all one sheet. Okay? But again, strips of cloth, and we absolutely know that the face cloth was different from the body cloth. So again, you know, it's highly unlikely, and again, I, I'd say a bunch of hogwash, as I already did, but that is uh, not something. And again, as you know, uh, the world just tries to venerate those things, and if it truly was, then people would be worshiping it. Okay, oh, that's the Jesus, that's the burial clothes, let's worship it. That's why we don't have any of the original writings of the, the disciples, because we'd be worshiping the books right now. Again, the pages and the print versus the words that are inside. And God doesn't want that uh, in anything that we do. But in any case, what we also recognize in Lazarus' burial cloths and then upon his resurrection, another Greek word, and this is what I alluded to earlier, which kira, and ultimately that also means strips of cloth, but this would be a lesser material than what Jesus Christ was buried in. So we have a different word for the body cloth, but interestingly enough, for the face cloth, to say that there's a different cloth for the face than there is for the body, we have a different word. And it's the same word that is used in regard to our Lord's face cloth upon his burial. All right. So again, just giving you some of the detail there and ultimately understanding the evidence that we uh, have seen now through the scriptures of the resurrection of our Lord. And that's what Peter and John saw. They saw the evidence. They saw the clothes still there. They saw them arranged in an interesting way. And as we are, 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 are noting in John's gospel in just a minute, how that face cloth was separate from the body cloth. And so ultimately we see all of this coming together as great evidence of the resurrection of our Lord. But unfortunately, they were still in the process of seeing is believing. They weren't quite yet there of believing is seeing, but that's going to come. And again, remember when Jesus Christ meets them all in the upper room later on that night, even before Thomas gets there and then when Thomas gets there, okay, even at that point they still were a little bit unbelieving. But when the presence of Jesus in resurrection form finally came, then they finally understood and recognized that he had been resurrected, and now they started to believe everything that he had told them about his resurrection, and then they followed him up to Galilee, as we know. So again, seeing they believed, again, not the right equation, but an okay equation, again, getting them going in the spiritual life, but we also see something else about Peter's reaction and uh, uh, in regard to the message that was given. And we see it both from his physical actions and the mentality of his soul. So again, I want to share those things with you uh, this morning when it talks about he went away to his home. So after witnessing the, sh the uh, clothing of our Lord in the tomb and the various arrangements, and we see the same thing in John's gospel, it says he went away to his tomb. And in John's gospel, they both went away to not to his tomb, to his home, okay? He went away to his home, okay? And we have the word uh, epikomai, and that word does mean to go away, to went, uh, went away. But what's interesting, the word home, which would typically be oikos in the Greek language, is not used here. And instead of oikos, we have the personal pronoun heatu. And heatu means he went to himself. Now, this could be an idiom to say that he went to his own place, he went to his own dwelling, or he went to his own possession. That's about as close as we can get there. He went to his own possession. So again, they have it as an idiom. He went to his own home. 
But the important aspect that we see here is that he went somewhere all by himself. You see, he wasn't going back to the other disciples at this point. Later on at night, we know they're all gathered together. But at this point in time, early in the morning, he just went back to his own place. And that is very curious to me why he would just go back. John did the same thing. It says he went back to his own place too. Even though in our English translations it says he went back to his home. That they both went back to their homes. But they just went back to their own place. So ultimately, as I said, this could be an idiom for the dwelling of where they were. But remember, their homes weren't in Jerusalem at this time. They were temporarily staying there for the holiday. But they basically just went back to a place by themselves. They went back to themselves. In other words, as I read this and understand it, they went back into their own heads. <laughs> they went back into their own heads. And as the women kept the message to themselves until they reached the apostles, John and now Peter are doing the same thing. They're just keeping it to themselves, and they kind of slink away. Why? Because we see in the next phrase the mentality of their soul. They're in bewilderment. They're like, what, what's going on here? And they're still not quite getting it. Even though they see the resurrection uh, of our Lord in regard to the, the uh, cloth being still in the tomb and the body not there, they were kind of blown away by all this information, and they weren't quite believing it as of yet. And we can recognize that because if they were believing it, wouldn't they be overjoyed, as I've said time and time again? Wouldn't they be excited? Wouldn't they be happy? Wouldn't they be going around and telling everybody? Again, we can give them a little bit of the you know, shadow of a doubt by saying maybe they still were in fear of their own personal lives, that they too would be crucified, as Jesus was. But again, wouldn't that just give you more confidence? Hey, wait a minute, they crucified him. He died, we know that he died, and yet he's alive. The grave cannot hold him. He's alive. And they still weren't referencing the word that Jesus Christ had given them previously, that he would rise on the third day. Again, they're not putting it all together yet. They're on the road to recovery, but they're not there yet. But again, it will come as we know. Just as sometimes in our lives, again, when we're on the road to recovery, it doesn't happen necessarily overnight. It does take time to recover. It does take time to throw off that old way of thinking, that old way of living, that old form of whether it be spirituality, if we were in a legalistic type of church, a denominational type of church, or whether it be we were steeped in sin. It does take time to overcome all of that. And these individuals are, are on the road to recovery, but yet, again, we'll see them getting there completely as it, uh, a few days down the road here. But what they were also doing, as we see Peter doing, he was marveling at what had happened. And that's the Greek word that we have, which is thumadzo, and it means to wonder, to admire, to be astonished, or to be amazed. Okay? So what's interesting about this word is that it can be used both in a positive sense and in a negative sense. The positive sense is that, wow, this is awesome, and I believe what I'm seeing here. The other is, Wow, this is incredible. How did this happen? And I don't believe it, okay? Well, you're kind of blown away, but you're not yet believing and accepting. I believe for Peter, it was on the ladder. Well, he was not yet believing. He's blown away by what he's seen. He's blown away by what he was heard, but he's not putting it all together as of yet. And he was absolutely astonished at the empty tomb of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, as I said, this word can be used for faithful appreciation, as it was in the first time it is used within the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. Our Lord was absolutely blown away by the faith of the centurion who believed that he could heal his servant. And he said, there's no greater faith in all of Israel than what I just saw in this Gentile. And he marveled at that, same Greek word. But Jesus bl uh, understood, recognized, and was believing in the faith of this individual. But yet it was amazing to him. It was awesome. But yet in the next time that this word is used is for the disciples. When they were out on the storm or in the storm, out on the ocean, in the boat with Jesus, and he calmed the wind and the, and the waves. And they were astonished. But they're like, what kind of man is this? It's interesting. You go back and read the scripture. What kind of man is this that can calm the storms uh, and, and the seas, the wind and the seas? Who can do that? And they weren't quite believing it. 
but they were blown away by it. So again, this word can have that dual application. And with Peter's uh, blown away uh, process now at the tomb, he's basically trying to figure out this whole thing and reconcile it within the mind of his soul. He's trying to figure it out. What's going on here? And unfortunately, he's not applying the word of God. He's living by what he sees and what he's experiencing. He's living by that. And that is not the way to live the spiritual life. You know, what you see, what you experience is not how, what dictates how we should function and operate. How we should function and operate is to know the word of God because we've taken it in in faith and apply that in scripture. And again, if you didn't know the Bible, would you know that there are angels with us right now? Do you believe that there are angels with us right now? There absolutely are angels all over this room right now. Every one of you has a guardian angel. And they're here with us right now. And there's probably a couple of demonic angels trying to mess things up too. And they hold them at bay. And that warfare is actually happening right now. Do you believe that? You don't see it, do you? But the Word of God tells us that. And therefore we know because we believe and have that faith. So again, that's how we operate the spiritual life. Unfortunately, in the world, we want to see to believe. The world wants us to see things on TV. We have to see it for ourselves. We have to believe it, you know, and that we can only believe it when we have an experience or interaction with it. But in the plan of God, it's having faith in God, His Word, and what He has said about His plan for your life, and the things that He has for you and for you to do, Believing in that and then operating in that. That's the spiritual life. Believing so that we can see. Not seeing to believe. So when we believe, we will see. And the principle that we can also take away from Peter's experience here is that if we have unresolved questions in our life, you know, why is this happening? What's this all about? Should I do this? What should I be doing here? If you don't have all the answers to the situation. Again, many of us don't want to make a move until we have everything down and locked in. And then I'll do it. And if there's still some confusion in our lives in the situation, but why is this happening? What's going on? I don't understand. You see, if those things are present within our lives, does that mean we are to stop and wait until we have all the answers and then move forward? Absolutely not. That's the time to really now buckle down and apply your faith and to continue to go forward in the plan of God and to continue to move forward in the action that God has for you. Again, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know what the outcome of tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know what the outcome of your actions today are going to have tomorrow. Okay. Does that mean we don't do something today because we don't know the results tomorrow? Absolutely not. What we are to do is walk in every day according to God's will and plan for our lives. Take the action that God has designed us to do today, even though we don't know what the end result might be. Unfortunately, too many people want to know the end so that they can then function and operate in the present now. That's seeing to believe. But believing so that we see is to take the action, move forward in the plan of God, and continue to walk in the will and plan of God. And if there are questions, if there are doubts, if there's hesitation, if there's you know, things that you're just not putting it all together yet, not quite sure, again, certainly pray about it, absolutely, and ask God to lead you. But many times he wants you to just get on that donkey and start to ride and get to the place that you're supposed to be. And then I'll take care of the rest. So again, that's a great principle that Peter is not quite experiencing here yet. He's still in the seeing to believe. He went away confused and befuddled. Didn't take any action. He just went off by himself. All by himself. Just went away. Rather than carrying the torch and going and telling everybody, why didn't he go back to the room where all the other disciples were? that heard the, w the message from the women and say, you know what, they're right. 
They were right. We thought they were crazy. We thought they were, you know, a gibberish, making this stuff up. We thought they were out of their minds. You know what? They were right. And Jesus is resurrected. Why didn't they at least do that? Again, later on, they're all gathered together in the upper room, and I think they're, they're all there questioning and asking, and, da, 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 and then all of a sudden Jesus appears. He's like, okay, I'll give you enough time. You haven't figured it out yet. i got to show myself, okay? I told you I was going to meet you in Galilee. That's where you're supposed to go and meet me. But you're not quite getting on the donkey yet. So i got to come to the room, and oh, here I am. All right, now do you believe? Now do you believe? Thank you very much. All right, let's go to Galilee. Let's do what we're supposed to do. And God will work in that way in mercy and grace as we've talked about. But again, there's no reward there. You see, our human good works is not rewardable. Only divine good production is rewardable. And divine good production comes when we believe and then we take action. We believe and then we see. So let's now turn to John's gospel. Let's see what John has to say. And then we'll uh, get into our communion. John chapter 20. And again, because, uh, you know, there's much overlap with a, a little bit of uh, additional information. We're not going to spend too much time in this passage. But we see in verses 3 through 10 what John wrote about Peter and now himself seeing and witnessing at the tomb. And just to remind you, chronologically, John chapter 20, verses 11 and 18 occur before what we're going to read now in John chapter th 20, chapter 20, verse 3 through 10. In other words, verses 11 through 18 is Mary Magdalene at the tomb. In John's writing, he wrote about him Mary first, and then at verse 3 he talks about himself and Peter, then he comes back to Mary and gives the detail about her experience at the tomb. When we read it, it seems like two experiences. When we read the other Gospels, we know it's only one. Okay? So uh, why did he do this? Well, like he started his Gospel, like the Bible started in Genesis chapter 1, okay? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, is like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? So John does that. He does the same thing here. Because Genesis 1 talks about the six days of creation, and on the seventh day he rested. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 1. Did I say Genesis? Genesis chapter 1 <laughs> talks about this. Then Genesis chapter 2 does it all over again. And it's not a new week. It's not new time. It's just relaying what happened in chapter 1 and adding some things to it. That's what happens here between verses uh, 3 and 10 and 11 through 18. Even though chronologically, it may seem awkward and that Mary got there twice, but it's actually just giving us the same scene, but from a different perspective, okay? So it's all the same thing. But in any case, now we read about uh, Peter and John. So John chapter 20, in verse 3, it says, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and again, that's John, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. And the other disciple ahead faster than Peter. So John ran faster and came to the tomb. And stopping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. So John gets there first. He sees what uh, the empty tomb with the linen wrappings, but didn't actually go in. Simon Peter, therefore, verse 6, also came following him and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there. Now in verse 7, and the face cloth, which had been on the face of his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. It's kind of interesting, that word itself, okay? It's the same word that, you know, John and Peter were, went off by themselves. Kind of interesting. All right, but it's by itself. Verse 8, So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb entered then also, and he saw and believed. Okay? Seeing is believing, unfortunately. Now verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But oikos isn't the word in the, new, in the Greek. It's heautu. They went off to themselves. Okay? So they went off to themselves. Again, might be an idiom for homes, but 
I think the Lord is trying to tell us a little bit something about what's going on, especially after verse 9. For they as yet did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. So it's kind of interesting because all the way back in John chapter 2, I believe in verse 28, I don't know if I wrote it down here, uh, but somewhere around there, all right, maybe 20, 28, okay, talks about the disciples not believing in Jesus yet, but it says, you know, after his resurrection they believed. So again, all the way back in chapter 2 of John's gospel, he talks about, hey, we didn't believe as of yet, but after all these things happened, then they believed, okay? Same thing's going on here. Even though he says they saw and believed, we have to take into consideration verse 9, they didn't understand the scriptures yet. So they didn't believe right then and there. It still took a little while because they weren't understanding as of yet. So again, we see this perspective. Now, as we uh, recognize in verse 9, again, here's the Greek that comes with it. We have a, a negative, udepo, and then oida is the Greek word for knowing or knowledge or full knowledge, and then hographe, the scriptures. They did not yet know fully the scriptures. Even though they've been taught the scriptures, they read the scriptures before, they weren't putting two and two together. So they understood the scriptures, but they didn't have the oida knowledge, the full knowledge as of yet. And then, as I said, John also used heautu for the returning to their homes. And again, as an idiom, but basically talking about going off by themselves. Now, don't have it on a slide, but let me just say uh, this in addition, and then we'll get into communion. It's kind of interesting. We have the two disciples and John's going to the tomb to witnessing the empty tomb. And what does the law say about approving anything in the court of law? You need two or more witnesses. Two witnesses, John and Peter. Okay? Luke just gave us one. Now we have John and Peter. Okay? The other two aspects of witnessing, the body cloth and the face cloth. You ever think about that? Two separate articles. Two pieces of evidence. And again, based on the customs of the burials back in the day, as we saw Lazarus buried in two different pieces of cloth, or at least strips of cloth for the body, and then the handkerchief, uh, or the face cloth for the face. Two pieces of evidence. So when we recognize why, you know, I'm going to give you a better than this, why the body cloth and the face cloth separated. I'm going to give you a better why, but the first why is to prove without a shadow of a doubt, proof of evidence according to the law that he was raised from the dead. Two pieces of evidence, two witnesses, two pieces of cloth that was separated, ultimately proving the resurrection of Jesus. And again, we could also talk about two witnesses, the women as one group of witnesses, the men now as another group of witnesses. Okay, So you have that too as well. So again, all of this is to prove that the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually did occur. So now we're going to pause and we're going to uh, celebrate our communion. But in doing so, I'm going to bring us back to, uh, you know, uh, uh, verses uh, uh, 7 and 8 in regard to what we're seeing happen here in regard to the face cloth and the body wrappings. And again, this is one of those pictures I don't like. OK, see how it's just a mess in the body stuff. OK, it's like he got unwrapped. OK, didn't happen. OK, he didn't get unwrapped. Nobody unwrapped him. He didn't unwrap himself. OK. But, again, the reason I chose this is because this has a good picture of the face cloth being folded and separated. And that's what I wanted to bring to your attention. All right, so uh, let's close in prayer, for, uh, and then uh, we'll get into our communion. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, his resurrection. We thank you for the object lesson of Peter and John and going to and witnessing these things and the little principles that we can pull out in regard to our own faith walk in you. And so, Father, we ask that you increase our faith. Uh, more and more each and every day so that we walk according to your will and in your plan all to your glory in jesus christ's name we pray